as responds to a changing security environment. Uh, thank you all for, for uh, being here. My name is Abe Denmark. I run the Asia program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, but I previously worked at NBR as a, a senior vice president for the political and security affairs. So for me, this is sort of like going back to my old high school. Uh, <laughs> it's great to see a lot of old friends and old colleagues. Um, and I, of course, any invitation they ask me to come and do something, I, my, I have an automatic yes uh, for NBR. And we're joined today by two uh, tremendous scholars in the field, um, really people who need no introduction, so I'll keep my introductions to them brief. First is Dr. Phil Saunders, who's director of the Center for the Study of Chinese Military Affairs at NDU, uh, their Institute for National Strategic Studies. And uh, Tom Menken, who's president and CEO of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, uh, also serving at uh, SAIS as a senior research uh, professor. Um, he and I actually worked together in the office of the Secretary of Defense during the Bush administration. Yep. Um, and it, the three of us actually are going to be testifying before the U.S. Uh, China Security and Economic Review Commission tomorrow. Yep. Um, so uh, uh, Roy, over there, we're going to be testifying for him. Uh, should be a fun day tomorrow. Um, but we got a great group here. And um, we'll start with Phil, then move on to Tom, and then take some uh, Q&A. So, sure. Well, our, our, my tasking is to talk about China's responses to a changing security environment. I have to start by saying these are my personal views, not those of NDU, the Department of Defense, or the US government, even though they ought to listen to what I say. Um, and I'm gonna do the classic Washington thing of sort of turning the task around. It, it is true that China likes to portray its policies as responses to a changing security environment or bad things that our other countries are doing that force them to respond. But I really think it's better to think of China as following an adaptive strategy, and that's the approach I'm gonna to try to take to tell you what I think that strategy is, how it is adapting, and where it has led China today. Um, so a starting point is to think about China as having a range of objectives, both positive and negative. And the negative ones we can think of as status quo objective. It's things that they wanna maintain or sustain or prevent from happening. And that includes uh, maintaining CCP rule, maintaining territorial integrity, preventing Taiwan independence, preventing loss of claimed PRC territory, maintaining cooperation with neighboring countries, especially on counterterrorism, counter-separatism, counter-extremism, preventing the emergence of a hostile US-led coalition, maintaining economic development, preventing Japan, South Korea, or Taiwan from going nuclear, and maintaining a stable regional environment that supports economic growth. And that's a big list. And these are things that take a lot of work and, and a lot of Chinese activity just to keep these things from happening or to hold on to what they have. So that's a starting point. Then I think they also have positive objectives, things they wanna get done, which we can think of as revisionist objectives. And that includes things like raising the living standards of the population, becoming a first rank military power by 2049, international respect for the accomplishments of China's system, regional acceptance of China's maritime claims, resolving its land border disputes, especially with India on favorable terms, unification with Taiwan, securing China's regional security position. And then you go on to things that are maybe stretch goals or, or even longer term goals, uh, reshaping the international order to be more compatible with China. I, I think of China as a moderate revisionist that wants to change things on the margin, partly because it doesn't want the responsibility of, uh, of running the international order. A couple things that I don't think are goals. I don't see China as territorially expansionist in terms of territories that it doesn't currently claim. Its claims date back to 1949 to the Republic of China, and they haven't really expanded since then, nor irredentist in terms of claiming territories with ethnic Chinese populations on them. So if you think about it as these two sets of goals, status quo goals and revisionist goals, that's helpful in getting a sense of the dynamics of Chinese strategy and policy. So the status quo goals require a degree of cooperation with regional states, even as China is trying to push this revisionist agenda that often works against the interests of these other countries. And if you push too hard, that threatens your status quo goals. And so for China, there's a need for balance, or to put it in Marxist terms, to manage the contradictions in its policy. And 
part of what you get with that dynamic is a period, periods of assertiveness when they're pushing forward and periods of restraint when they're pulling back to defuse opposition. Um, and another way of thinking about it is you want to make incremental progress on this revisionist agenda, but you can't lose on the status quo goals. So that's, there's the relative priority there. And from this perspective, the peacetime competition for China is a matter of incrementally improving its position where they can, rather than fully reaching a desired end state. And I think that's the big question, is for some of these things like Taiwan unification or maritime territorial goals, can they get where they want to go ultimately without using force? Let me talk a little bit about the tool set. We at National Defense University sometimes talk about this as dime, diplomatic, information, military, and economic. And of those tools, I would say economic and diplomatic are the ones that have been most important for China. It's economic inducements in terms of market access, aid, foreign direct investment, tourism, have been a key part of expanding Taiwan, uh, China's influence. But we've also seen the other side, that those are turning into tools that it will use coercively to punish countries uh, when they disappoint China or don't go along with what it wants. I think a big improvement is Chinese diplomacy. They used to only want to operate bilaterally, to be afraid of multilateral institutions, They've learned how to play that game effectively over the last 15 years and even created new alternative institutions that it can dominate, like Shanghai Cooperation Organization, AIIB, ASEAN Plus Three, uh, and increasingly see regional and global institutions as a battleground for competition in international politics. Uh, in terms of information, a big part of this is China's narrative, that it's uniquely peaceful and it's the U.S. that is a source of instability and trouble. Um, and that's not an accurate narrative, but it's one they push with great energy. And then finally, in terms of military, they have an increasingly capable military and paramilitary forces, uh, Coast Guard and Maritime Militia. But on the whole, I would argue they have exercised a degree of restraint in their use. They've tried to stay below the threshold of lethal force and control the risk of escalation. So that's part of the strategy as well. I think we've seen an increasing willingness since about 2010. Isaac Cardin's in the audience, and he worked on some of this research at NDU, to show off its military capabilities, to try to intimidate neighbors, and to try to shape the Asia-Pacific region. So I've described this set of status quo goals uh, and revisionist goals. I've talked about uh, the tension between them. How does China manage that tension? And I think there's a variety of tactics they use. They try to split the US from its allies and partners, increasingly using economic inducements and punishments, trying to divide the opposition, uh, both within ASEAN and Asia, and usually by singling out only one target at a time. So they focus on, on, on one thing at once, uh, using incremental salami tactics to expand their effective control without triggering a military confrontation, emphasizing paramilitary forces like the Coast Guard rather than military forces like the Navy, uh, trying to deter challenges by rival claimants, and again, exercising restraint in, youth, in lethal force. So we talk about China as an aggressive country, and it is aggressive in some ways, but it's doing it in particular ways with particular tactics. Uh, employing united front and political warfare tactics to weaken adversary will and an alliance cohesion, uh, negotiating crisis management mechanisms to reduce the escalation risk. It's a good thing generally to have those, but it lets them push harder because they're less afraid of the consequences. Um, and I think this alternating pattern of aggression and then restraint that I've described has made it really hard for the United States to mobilize a coalition to respond to China, because whenever they push too far, they have pulled back. Now, a big piece of this strategy is managing the United States. The US is the country that's best positioned uh, to either help China get what it wants or stand in its way. <laughs> Uh, so China sought to avoid a major confrontation, even as it's building military capabilities aimed at the U.S. and trying to erode the U.S. regional position. I think Chinese leaders are deeply suspicious of U.S. intentions. They see us as pursuing subversion, containment, and regime change. But they don't want to either have a confrontation or a war with the U.S. or produce a U.S.-led alliance against China. So they've used limited cooperation and economic interdependence to try to manage this relationship. Uh, 
They've exploited difference between the U.S. and its allies to weaken the U.S. regional position. Um, they're exploiting the fact that Asian countries want to avoid picking sides between China and the U.S., which makes it difficult to mobilize regional support. I think in some ways, we talked about the BRI a lot yesterday, the Belt and Road Initiative. That's an effort to avoid confronting the U.S., to focus China's energy and attention in Eurasia and not in East Asia and Southeast Asia where the U.S. is more active. Um, and we start to see that they've begun to pressure U.S. allies and partners to limit their security cooperation with the United States. And the net result of all of this is China has been able to improve its relative military capabilities and posture without directly confronting the U.S. And I think that's weakened our strategic position in Asia. And you can think about China as having a repertoire of tactics that they use, that they dip into when they face a challenge. So this has been a very effective strategy, but I would argue it's gone wrong over the last couple of years. And so what's gone wrong and where does it leave China today? I think they overestimated U.S. relative decline after the financial crisis, and they pushed too hard. And that's important to note, as, as Aaron Friedberg said yesterday, this predates Xi Jinping. But Xi Jinping has reinforced this trend. Uh, I think there's been overconfidence that economic <laughs> interdependence and the business community would mitigate U.S. and European and Asian responses to Chinese assertive reactions. A dismissal of the rebalance in U.S. efforts to strengthen its regional position. I think they underestimated the extent to which this was happening. Uh, their efforts to promote national champions uh, through industrial policies and illegal tech transfer uh, have eroded support of the U.S., European, and foreign business community. They've been less restrained in their use of economic punishments and military intimidation. So instead of picking one country at a time, they've challenged multiple countries. And a Chinese academic told me a couple years ago, China's now using economic sanctions against Mongolia, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, and others. And we're not getting much out of that. Um, um, I think there's a mistaken belief that other countries would eventually give up their territorial and sovereignty claims in the face of superior Chinese power, and overconfidence that the U.S. needed China to manage North Korea, and that would prevent a shift in U.S. policy. And then finally, I think there's a misjudgment of President Trump. They saw him as a businessman, they saw him as a deal maker, and they thought he would be satisfied with relatively modest traditional economic concessions from the Chinese playbook. You buy more U.S. soybeans, you do other things to rectify the trade balance, but you don't change your underlying policies. So where does that leave China today? Uh, this is an argument that they've made some misjudgments and missteps. Where I think they are now is trying to stabilize relations with the United States and prevent a shift to a hostile relationship and not knowing quite how to get there. Can they make a trade deal that satisfies President Trump while minimizing changes to Chinese economic policies and strategies that they see as necessary for continued growth? And I think there's a range of views within the cabinet on what a good deal looks like. That's something the president is gonna decide for himself. And the Chinese aren't clear how to read that. What would that decision look like? Can they play on the reluctance of others to see a US-China <clears throat> confrontation and an economic decoupling that hurts their economic interests? And can they rely on others to try to limit US pressure? Uh, and conversely, part of that is can they use economic inducements to either win support from other countries or keep them on the sidelines in US-China competition? And as part of that, I would argue over the last two years, we've seen a reduction of, US, of Chinese pressure in the South China Sea. We've seen efforts to improve relations with ASEAN in terms of negotiating a code of conduct improving ties with countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines. They backed off their pressure against Japan and South Korea. And to me, this seems like a tactical return to that earlier period of restraint because they know they've pushed too far. I think they know it's not possible to get back to the status quo. At this point, the goal is to limit the damage with the United States and discourage other countries from following the U.S. lead and participating in anti-China coalition. So where I think that leaves us today is an increasing U.S.-China competition for influence in East Asia, South Asia, and throughout the Asia Pacific. That's going to play a big role. That's the battleground. That's the political, military, economic battleground for U.S. competition. 
And how we do in that battle is going to have a lot to say about how U.S.-China competition turns out. Great. So. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Abe. And it's a, it's a real pleasure, pleasure to be here. And I think hopefully my, uh, uh, my remarks will complement uh, Phil's. I think Phil did a, a good job of talking about uh, the Chinese leadership's perspective, Chinese objectives. Um, I'd like to flip it around a little bit to, uh, to the U.S. side. By and large, uh, in policy discussions, we've in in recent years we we've, we've seen a much more sophisticated, much more reasonable, open discussion of the fact of uh, competition between the United States and and, and China. Um, although I think we're we're teetering on the on the verge, at least within the the Defense Department and the defense community, of using the, uh, uh, the, the term great power competition as just kind of another, another buzzword without really uh, going beneath the surface and, and exploring what we're really, what we're really talking about. Um, so that's, that's really where I'd like to take the conversation in the, in the short time uh, that I have this morning, which is um, to, to address a question that I think um, needs to be addressed as, as we move forward, which is what specifically is it about China's rise, what is it specifically about uh, the Chinese Communist Party's objectives that concerns us? I think, I think, again, Phil has done a good job of laying out China's objectives. Well, what is it about that that really, that really concerns us? Uh, it seems to me that's a, that's a fundamental conversation to have uh, as we formulate our strategy going forward, as we, as we uh, evaluate the, uh, the possibility of a, of a deal between uh, Trump and Xi, whether we even think about some sort of a, a modus vivendi, we really need to get to the heart of it, which is what is it about uh, China and China's rise that really concerns us? And I, I, think, I think it really does come down to four things. And for each of these, I'd, I'd like us to, to visualize um, a dial or a, or a, or a rheostat. Um, maybe the dial goes to 11, maybe it only goes to 10. But, <laughs> but uh, um, the, first, the first dial, uh, represents the uh, attention of the CCP leadership. And um, one or zero is uh, internal and 10 is, is external. And, and realizing that, that any government is uh, more internally focused than, than externally, ours, theirs, others, I think one of the things that concerns us is that that growing external focus on the part of the Chinese government manifested in 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 uh, in all the ways that 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 Phil talked about. Uh, uh, the Chinese leadership is increasingly looking to the outside world, and of course, not just uh, the Western Pacific, not just Asia, but 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 mm -hmm. globally. Um, and that Chinese activism in 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 its many manifestations is a uh, is is an area of concern, whether it's military activism, whether it's Chinese uh, attempts at political influence, economic statecraft. Um, so that's, that's, that's clearly one, one thing that, uh, that concerns us. The second, uh, the second rheostat, the second dial is geopolitical. And so let's imagine the, the one there is labeled continental and the 10 is uh, labeled maritime. So it's not just the fact that, that China's more engaged with the outside world, but it's that it's China's maritime focus. It's in particular China's focus in maritime Asia, the Asian maritime littoral, mm -hmm. uh, which contains um, US allies, uh, US territory, uh, vital trade routes. Right? Um, so at a period where China has been more active in maritime Asia and beyond, that's that's been one of the things that's really gotten our attention. Uh, even before the island building campaign, but pressure on our allies, pressure on our territory. Um, now, of course, that, that, that dial may be resetting itself a little bit um, with, the, with the Belt and Road Initiative and, and uh, in some ways China's rediscovery of the Asian continent. We'll, we'll get to that, but, but clearly it's been, particularly that, that, that activity in maritime Asia that's, that's been of concern. Um, the third, uh, the third dial, um, uh, political scientists will, will, would love because that that's that's uh, that one would be labeled attitude towards the status quo, and uh, the one is status quo and the ten is non-status quo. 
And, and to be clear, it's, it's our perceptions of Chinese behavior. Because again, I think, I think Phil did a, did a good job of laying out what is status quo or non-status quo from China's perspective. But, but uh, the truth is China's engaged in a, in a whole a set of behaviors that are increasingly at variance with our view of the status quo. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party, Chinese leadership appears less and less satisfied with the status quo, a status quo um, that has benefited us, I would say also has benefited China quite a lot over, over the decades. But that non-status quo behavior or that dissatisfaction with the status quo uh, is, is, is a third uh, cause of concern. And then, and then, uh, and then fourth, uh, the fourth dial, the fourth rheostat that uh, sometimes we, we like to talk about, uh, sometimes we don't like to talk about, but matters a lot, uh, I think, to, to the American people, to our allies, and, and matters a lot actually to, uh, to China's perceptions of the U.S., has to do with China's political system. So, so that, that rheostat, the one would be labeled authoritarian and the 10 would be uh, uh, would be labeled pluralistic, liberal, whatever. Um, and so it's, the, it's, it's China's increasing authoritarian tendencies or, or, or vis vis visible authoritarian tendencies uh, tends, to, tends to concern us, uh, tends to concern us a lot. Um, and I think you know, one, one can make the argument, um, I have made the argument, that all other things being equal, if, if, if uh, we had a China where the, the settings were different on those dials, but everything else, everything else was the same, economic growth, uh, what, what have you, we would be much less concerned about, about China. So if you, if you had a China that was more internally focused, if we had a China that was more continentally focused, if we had a China that was uh, bought into elements of the, the international status quo, maybe not even the whole thing, but much more bought into the, the international status quo, and a, a China that was more pluralistic, all other things uh, being equal, we'd be much less concerned. And I say that because we have another rising great power that fits that description, and it's called India. And we're much less concerned about Indian behavior. Right. India is much more internally focused, continentally focused, bought into many of the elements of the international status quo, although not all, uh, and deliciously pluralistic. <laughs> right. Um, so I, I advance that as a, as, a, as a topic for discussion and debate, because I think it's, it's, if, if we are going to formulate a, a strategy, we need to really start with a diagnosis. And that diagnosis should be based around what is it about China uh, that dissatisfies us? What is it about Chinese behavior? that causes us uh, concern. So I think, you know, uh, as, as we think about what our goal should be in an era of great power competition, there I said it, um, we, we should, uh, that strategy should address or should at least ask the question, what can we do to address those, uh, those, those elements of, of Chinese strategy that, uh, that, we, that we find uh, of concern? The answer might be nothing. Maybe there's nothing we could do. Um, ten, not to believe that that's the case, but we should at least start with that. And then um, second, again, if, if we're, and, and I've, I've spent a lot of time recently talking to folks uh, on Wall Street um, who want to know uh, when the trump she deal is going to be coming um, and how long it's going to last. And I think my, 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 one of my side jobs has been to uh, pour cold water on, 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 on all that, which is uh, interesting question, but maybe the wrong question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever deal we get, if we get one in the short term, is going to be short term and tactical. Because again, if you follow my logic, if these are the things that that uh, that concern us, tell me how a some trade deal between Trump and G is going to deal with these things. I uh, don't think so. And then even more expansively, uh, if you're looking for some sort of a modus vivendi between uh, China and the United States. Show me how that modus vivendi would deal with uh, the, these elements that, uh, that, I've, that I've laid out. Um, so hopefully uh, with that, I mean, I know we're, we're supposed to inform, but also provoke. Hopefully that is sufficiently uh, informative and provocative to, uh, to fuel some good discussion for the rest of our time. Great. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, both, I thought, very uh, rich and important uh, discussions. Um, well, we have about, half an hour left in our session. So while you're thinking about what questions you want to ask, I wanted to ask a question for both of them. Both Phil and Tom, you've uh, 
put out a, uh, a, a lot of different issues onto the mm -hmm. table. Um, and both of you um, talked about great power competition. Now, a few weeks ago, I was talking to some, uh, some officials from the Pentagon and they started asking me about GPC. Right. And I, I, a person who's worked twice at the Pentagon, right. I, I'm, I got a good acronym game, but I didn't <laughs> get what GPC was until eventually they explained it was great power competition, yeah. which to me was not a good sign. But it had become an acronym. <laughs> yeah. um, so we've all talked about great power competition. We saw in the national defense strategy, the national security strategy, that this is sort of the one of the guiding themes of politics um, and international relations for the Trump administration, but we haven't gotten a lot of detail about what that competition mm -hmm. actually means. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if uh, both of you could sort of sort through the issues that you've both pulled out and give us your sense of what you believe the United States and China are competing over. Mm -hmm. what, is, what are the key aspects of that competition and what does, from an American perspective, what does a successful competition in these areas look like? Okay. Well, let me do a couple things and then Tom will, Tom will fill it out. So there's the competition we're most familiar with from the Cold War, which is a military technical competition, especially in the Indo-Pacific region. So that's about power projection capability. That's about relative balance. That's about uh, technolo technological superiority in the military. And that's the most familiar to us from the Cold War and from my perspective, what the Pentagon is most focused on and within its kind of core competency to think about that competition. Uh, so that's a piece of it. What I think is the harder to grasp is the competition for influence within the Indo-Pacific. That in, in a real sense, the battleground is all the countries in the Indo-Pacific and how they position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the United States and China. Because if we don't have allies, if we don't have bases in the Asia Pacific, if we're, if we're rolled back to Guam and Hawaii, it's very hard for the US to maintain a, a robust military presence uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So that battleground, and that's as much that, that involves uh, diplomacy, that involves economics, it does involve military, but it's a much more ambiguous thing in terms of how do you measure influence, where are the critical thresholds where it works against you. And that's a part that we're still trying to get our head around, I think, in the State Department and the Department of Defense, how to define that aspect of the competition. What do we care about? Uh, there's arguably an ideological competition. I don't think China has an ideology that it's trying to export in the way that the Soviets were. But they do want to make changes uh, in how global and regional institutions uh, and norms function that better suit their interests. That's what rising powers do. It shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, and in many cases, since we built the status quo, we see that as, as um, negative for our interests. So I think there's an ideological competition there that manifests in specific institutions, rules, and norms. Um, and that's, that's part of it, too. And then finally, that manifests, uh, as Tom said, beyond the Indo-Pacific, because we see a China that's increasingly active around the world, uh, including in places that the US has traditionally regarded as our backyard. And that's a question I don't think we've really got our heads around. Do we have to be everywhere that China is? Everywhere they are, we need to be responding to it. How do we set priorities? How do we define what China is doing that really threatens our interests? and where we need to respond. And I think that's very much mm -hmm. undefined at this point. So, so yeah, Abe, th yeah, thanks, thanks for making my point about, about jargon. And, and I think that's, um, I, that is a real concern, right? Because um, for, for a couple of reasons. One is, I, I think, you know, it's, it's very American. I think it's a very Western way of, uh, of, of thinking about uh, the world. We tend to think about things dichotomously. We tend to think either you're at peace or you're at war. Or now, <clears throat> using the new, uh, the new lingo, either you're in competition or you're in conflict, right? And I think that's, that's a very deeply held American cultural view. It's not unique to the United States, but we tend to view things dichotomously. Uh, I, think the, um, I think the Chinese, I think others, tend not to embrace that 
dichotomy. They tend to see things as much more of a spectrum. And so uh, I think one of the concerns is that we've just sort of, we've substituted competition for peacetime in, in at least some of, our, some of our thinking. And then we have this, you know, then we think about war, when in fact, if you look at the interaction that's going on between China and the United States now, I mean, uh, and certainly it's also the case uh, with, with Russia, um, it goes beyond what we would consider kind of peacetime competition. I think our our notions of competition are also uh, sub sometimes burdened by um, other notions of competition, right? So it's not it's not like a sports game where you have a clearly defined field and rules and referees that throw you know throw uh, throw flags when you violated the rules. Uh, for me, when I think about competition, it's somewhere between cooperation and conflict, though it can have elements of both. Um, and so. What are we competing over? I think, you know, for, for China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party leadership is ultimately competing over its existence and its continued rule. Uh, and so that involves not only internal security, but it also involves a regional environment and even, I think, increasingly a global environment that is conducive to the perpetuation of the CCP's authoritarian rule. And that's why I think we're, it's increasingly, you know, we're, we're not talking about something that is neatly defined uh, in a regional frame, let alone the, the uh, area of responsibility of a global combatant command um, with a changing name, uh, right? So, so in order to preserve its rule, the CCP feels that it needs to exert influence over Chinese students Chinese citizens all across the world. Uh, and that includes political influence activities, that includes intelligence activities that are, that are worldwide. In order to seek political influence, uh, China has engaged in all sorts of economic statecraft, including some pretty predatory and malicious practices that are global in their, in their nature, in furtherance of its technology development goals, its military goals, uh, China has engaged in uh, economic espionage that is, again, global in its scope, not regional. So I think for us, that, that poses a whole bunch of challenges, right? Because we're used to thinking about um, China as uh, an Asia issue, we're, uh, and, and whether it's DOD or state, we're used to thinking about China fitting into a, a, a bin, an area of responsibility, a, a regional bureau, when in fact, um, you know, the, the rise of China and China as a, as a global power really means that, that China uh, really uh, influences a whole bunch of issues. Mm -hmm. Fascinating uh, a, a piece of, of historical trivia. Throughout the Cold War, there was no office in the office of the Secretary of Defense responsible for the Soviet Union. There was no Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War. Um, the position of uh, the DASDI for Russia and Eastern Europe was created at the end of the Cold War by the Bush 41 administration. Why? Because the reality of the Cold War was that Russia, you know, the Soviet uh, challenge was pervasive. Why, why would you bin it in a small, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a single office? Not to say we're, uh, we're entering a new Cold War, but given the pervasiveness of, uh, of China's influence and the multidimensionality of it, I think we, we need to get away from just thinking about it as, as centered in a, in a particular organization, specific, uh, specific region or, or domain. Well, thanks to you both. Uh, very good answers. Uh, we can take a few questions now. Um, so please uh, identify yourself organization and make sure your question ends at the question mark. Uh, Peter Humphrey and a former colleague of, of uh, INSS. I'm wondering if uh, when we look at somewhere around 1950, we made a decision that Russian situation is not going to get any better. We're going to have a long-term campaign and try and break the Soviet Union. So here we are. Um, we have another situation. We know there's zero chance it's going to get any better. Uh, isn't it sort of time to think when do we begin the clandestine campaign to break the Communist Party? Should, should that have started a few years ago? Should we be starting it now? Can we goof off for another 10 years, knowing that the price is ever increasing? 
You want to take a first crack at that, Phil? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I have two thoughts on it. You know, first, our policy up to this point has focused on a balance of competition and cooperation with China. And if we were overtly trying to overthrow their government, I think you kiss the cooperation piece of that bye-bye. <clears throat> and that has consequences which I don't think people think about a lot. You know, for obvious things like climate change, but do we have a functional security council? Can you, uh, can you have functional global institutions? Uh, you know, what is the Chinese response to that? Uh, and I think a lot of it is that turns us in a much more confrontational direction. So that's kind of one point, that there's a cost in overtly setting our goal at regime change in China. And the second is the question, can you do it? Uh, I mean, if you look at what the Chinese Communist Party has done, it has tried to avoid any potential alternative leadership. You know, that's, and, that's, and that's a trend that has intense, it's been there all along, but it has intensified over the last decade uh, in suppressing civil society and suppressing any alternative center of power that might challenge CCP leadership. So then you sort of ask, well, how is it you're going to subvert this regime and bring it down? What are the tools and mechanisms that you're going to do? I don't think that changes things. I mean, I think Chinese who want to get information about the outside can find ways to do it. And I don't think just the availability of information about what's really going on out in the world uh, would bring down the regime. So, yeah, so I would reframe it slightly. Uh, and I'd go back to those four RIA, RIA stats, right? So, uh, and so the first one, right, that uh, external versus internal focus. I do think it's in our interest uh, for the... Chinese Communist Party to focus more, you know, marginally more internally uh, than than externally, uh, and you know, uh, certainly a Chinese Communist Party that is concerned about um, its legitimacy, its staying power, is going to have to devote more more attention to internal matter, even more attention to internal matters than to external matters. So I think it's it's worth it's worth thinking about. What are the tools at our disposal to do that and, and evaluating them? And I think, as Phil says, it's not all positives. There are, there are negatives as well. But I think it is, it is worth um, that, that's, you know, it is worth thinking about in that, um, in that context. Are there options to open up uh, discourse within China um, and to get around, break through the, the, the Great Firewall? I think that's worth, that's worth discussing. Um, similarly, and I think here you're, you're, um, you'd be riding on an you know, existing tendency that's already going this direction. I do think a, a China that is more engaged with, concerned with, bogged down on, uh, on the Asian continent is of less con would be of less concern to us, right? Because it's been the fact that, it, that China has enjoyed peaceful continental borders that has allowed it to expand into maritime, maritime Asia, I think, which is historically kind of quite, quite unusual in Chinese history, right? So should that, if that should change, um, if China has to, again, devote more attention to, con to the continent, then ceteris paribus, yeah, it can devote less attention to, uh, to, to maritime Asia. And then my fourth, the fourth one, uh, my fourth RIA stat, on uh, authoritarian versus pluralistic, I think it's worth asking the question, what are the tools at our disposal to do that? What are the pros and cons? Um, again, uh, reverting to history, you know, it's, it, it's worthwhile remembering that, that the architects of the Reagan administration strategy against the Soviet Union which I think played a, played a heavy role in, in uh, the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union. Sort of the, 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 the strongest exponents of that strategy didn't predict its, its eventual success or the magnitude of its eventual success. What, what they predicted or what they were seeking to do was influence the next generation of Soviet leaders to bring into power a, the next generation of leaders that would be more moderate uh, more, uh, less confrontational than, than the then existing um, 
uh, leadership. So they, in, in a way, they succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. I think that's that's a that's a that's a useful thing to keep in mind as as we try to think about our strategic options going forward. Uh, if I if I may, I want to not pick a fight because I agree sure. with most of what Tom said, but I, but I want to make the point that China's economic growth inherently involves more external entanglements and requires a maritime peace. So if you look at imported sure. oil and gas, sure. that's that's seaborne. If you look at China's sure. trade, that's mostly sure. seaborne, uh, despite railroads and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So there's a way in which as China's become more economically integrated in that world, that sure. gives them interests that go well beyond continental Asia. Sure. And there's a sense in which, you know, you're probably not gonna roll that back. Um, and, and I think you're right, it does, drive them to do things which challenges mm -hmm. our interests and naval superiority and things yeah. like that. Um, but I'm not sure how much you can turn that rheostat down. Well, in part, they're, they're, they're turning the rheostat themselves, right, with the investments in continental Asia uh, that will, uh, you know, I would, I would suppose, um, I won't use the, the P word for predict, but will, will lead to greater friction uh, with their continental neighbors. And, and invest resource investments security investments mm -hmm. will have to flow against that so yeah not talking about abandoning the seas right. um but i mean the fact is that china it china is a continental power it's a continental power that's gone to sea and continental powers that have gone to sea historically have faced the uh, the dilemma as you've laid it out that they are dependent for their wealth for their prosperity on international commerce and yet as continental powers going to sea they they don't they will never fully have the means to safeguard that. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's uh, France in a previous era, uh, Russia, Germany in previous eras, or China today, that's what well, sucks it's, to be a continental power and it's great to be a maritime power, but there's nothing they or we can do to alter that fundamental fact. So. Right, thank you. Chris, back. Uh, thank you very much. I was wondering uh, what the panelists thought in terms of how to think through increasing Chinese influence and presence um, kind of west of the Malacca Strait. Um, so Middle East, Africa. Um, and at one level, it's kind of easy for the US government not to want greater Chinese influence there. There's both a concern about Chinese transit or basing, temporary basing or more permanent basing, mm -hmm. uh, concern about the US getting pushed out. At another level, the the more China is present in a place, the more there'll be incidents with Chinese businessmen that cause local frictions. And, and west of the Malacca, the, the sort of advantage, it seems to me, for U.S. forces are, is pretty dramatic. So any, any Chinese presence west of there is something that can be severed in the event of a severe conflict. So um, there's this desire to kind of push China's influence as close, uh, to, to kind of keep it close to the mainland as much as possible. But I wonder whether there's some benefit in China having to do more public and private goods provision in the world to kind of bog China down and how we should think about um, letting China do more in order for, to increase the cost that China faces on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I agree with the thrust of your question. I think, I think what would be very helpful actually is uh, an audit of that. I mean, if you will, an audit of the, of the pluses and minuses for China and the pluses and minuses for us, realizing that those are, those are not necessarily the same. Um, I think, so, so China going global affords China the ability to make some colossally bad decisions. Uh, whereas, you know, a China that's focused close to, close to home and with a very tightly focused set of security concerns um, you can still make colossally bad decisions, but uh, you know I think I think the chances of that are are, are much are much lower. Um, again, I don't want to strain the you know um, strain the analogy. I don't want to I don't want to improperly apply a historical analogy. But you look at uh, you know the Soviet uh, thir presence in the third world in the in the 1970s 1980s uh, that led to tr tremendous costs, and the you know the costs of Soviet empire. Uh, wound up being, you know, being considerable. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, I think that 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 balance really does really does need to be weighed. And I would agree with Phil's earlier point that just because the Chinese are doing something, we 
it doesn't necessarily mean we should oppose it. In some cases, maybe we want to encourage it. Um, you know, hey, uh, go ahead, um, double down on it um, because it's, it would be an unwise, unwise investment. But also realizing um, we we only have limited agency uh, over these things. So, yeah, I just would add two points. You know, one, there's a tendency in the Chinese system to overreact. So when Xi Jinping endorses Belt and Road, everybody wants to be on board with Belt and Road. And you go too far, you do things that don't make sense. We're in the midst of China kind of recalibrating that. Um, but you can make, you know, that's something the Chinese system does is it mobilizes resources and directs them. But that means you can make big strategic mistakes. And then the second point is that I, I think this is a debate within China right now. You have these expanding overseas interests. How do you protect them? And you know, what is the mix of security cooperation and assistance mm -hmm. with host governments? Can you use private security? Do you want stability in other places? What's the military role in that? And that's a very active debate. And for some things like SLOC protection, PLA Navy is right there saying, mm -hmm. that's a Navy mission and nobody else can do that. For other things like protecting investments in foreign countries, they're very aware, I think, of that using a military instrument to do that has some big costs, um, costs and risks involved. Great. We have about 10 more minutes time. Maybe we'll collect a few questions. Let's get from, from Susan. Then. Thanks very much, Susan Lawrence, Congressional Research Service. Really enjoying this debate. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, Huawei. Where does that fit in U.S.-China competition in the in the various models that you've shown? I, I'm not seeing it in um, in the the, the Raya stats analysis <laughs> that you put out there. You know, where does Huawei fit in all that? Um, but both of you, if you could talk a bit about U.S.-China competition in that realm, what is it that that um, that represents? Okay. Can we go ahead and collect another question? Okay. Yes, good morning. My name is Robert Shines of Bright Group Consulting USA. Uh, I thank the panel for the presentation. My question is toward how much longer uh, is it realistic to expect China to show strength on this issue, given U.S. maneuvers and now it's allied maneuvers, mm -hmm. France, the U.K., and the Taiwan Straits? Okay. Um, well, let me tackle Susan's question first. You know, and perhaps I am remiss in not having talked about economic competition uh, of this. And there's a piece of that that involves uh, dual use things and, and economic relationships that have a security component. And Huawei is part of that because operating a telecoms network inherently gives a capability to collect intelligence using that network and potentially to disrupt it in a moment of crisis. So there's that piece, but there's also an economic competition piece. And I think this is ties to a lot of what we talked over the last couple days about how China's economic model and industrial policy and support for their industries poses a competitive threat to US companies and European countries and Japan and South Korea. So there's that piece of it too. And in the United States, we're very uncomfortable with industrial policy and the state intervening to help particular companies. Um, and, but we haven't quite got a handle on that competitive dimension, but that's clearly part of the Chinese challenge. And I think that's, that's a more productive approach to think about in mobilizing support from Europe, from Japan, South Korea. There's a lot of countries that share, that share these economic competition concerns, even if they're inclined to dismiss some of those security concerns about Huawei. But I think that's a challenge for the US. We see both those sets. And when we go out with the message that anything on your Huawei 5G phone is going straight to Beijing, there are countries that say, well, that may be true, but it's cheaper. You know, the US isn't making 5G phones. Mm -hmm. What is the alternative? You know, that's our decision to make uh, where we draw that, that line. Um, and I think this is the first you know, this is the first battle in a longer set of conflicts with the U.S. and its allies over economic relations with China. We are more alarmed about this. We're going to draw the line in a different place. But the degree to which our allies share that view or when they don't share that view, how do we respond? Are we going to strong arm them and try to get them on board with that? Um, I think that's a big question. Let me let Tom weigh in on this. Yeah, I, I just, other question. Uh, I'd agree with what Phil said. And I think, look, uh, 
this is a, I think a critically important topic of discussion. And, and the broader topic is, you know, what is critical infrastructure? What does critical infrastructure look like in, in the information age in the 21st century? I think we've, there's always been, and I agree with, with, with Phil that, you know, by and large, the US, uh, uh, US government, US people are, are uh, uncomfortable with industrial policy, but there's always been a notion of that there are certain critical infrastructure that we need to protect. Uh, and I think the issue of Huawei, ZTE, and, and, and 5G networks really brings that back to the fore. Uh, and so, you know, the related question is, well, yeah, what, what, how much do you, how much do the American taxpayers, how much does the American government value security? And I actually think the, uh, the Australian government did a very good job when uh, the Australian prime minister uh, banned Huawei from, uh, from Australian networks communicating with the Australian public. And the, 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 the message was essentially, we've taken this decision for national security concerns. You are going to pay X dollars more over Y months on your, on your, on your telecom bills. In exchange for that, you now have assurance of the security of, 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 of your networks. And it's not just about inter, uh, intercepting communications, with 5G, 5G and Internet of Things, it's about you know, really just security of all sorts of things. So I think that's the type of, of conversation that, that needs to be had. The fact that it's Huawei and, and, uh, and, and ZTE, uh, that's important. But the main, the main argument is, is, about, is about security and security of, uh, of infrastructure and the ability to, of a government to guarantee the security of infrastructure that, uh, that the uh, population uses. All right, come back to the Taiwan question. Um, I think over the long term, China's committed to trying to achieve unification of Taiwan. Uh, there isn't an urgent deadline for that. We can argue about whether the great rejuvenation of the, of the Chinese people implies a 2049 deadline. Uh, but they've always left ambiguity on that. And I don't think that Xi Jinping is in a hurry to get this done. He is facing a bunch of other domestic and international challenges. Um, and the costs of resolving this situation with force are very high. Even if China has the military capability, which I don't think they have yet, but they're working hard to get it, um, that's a huge risk to try to resolve this with force. It has huge costs in terms of what does Asia look like the day after? What do US-China relations look like the day after? And I think China's approach is to try to figure out a way to resolve this on their terms without running those risks and paying those costs. And certainly they are in a mode of trying to pressure Tsai Ing-wen and the government, including using military means. Um, but I don't think this changes the fundamental dynamics there. <coughs> I would like to see Taiwan do more for its own defense, uh, spend more and put more emphasis on that to try to make it an even harder challenge for the PLA to think about an invasion or think about a blockade. Um, but I don't think there's, uh, I don't think this is an urgent issue on China's agenda or, or to put it in the framework that I started with, this is a goal they wanna get done, but incremental progress is good enough for now. Um, we just have a, a, just a couple minutes left. Um, I think we have time if we could do one question very rapidly. Um, over here. Uh, Richard Coleman, I retired from Customs and Border Protection. Um, we spent the last maybe 10, 15 years greasing the skids for importing goods in the United States and worked in true partnership with the trade community, Sears, back in then. Costco, Walmart, uh, and the economic power of Asia and China, uh, they worked with us to improve security, but in, in, in return, CBP was, uh, say, greasing the skids. And I can't imagine what the campaign would have to be like, even though it's, uh, you know, uh, makes sense to say do not buy Chinese. What does that do to the Walmart model? What does that do to Costco? 
the pushback, not from China, but from our own domestic industries would be astonishing. If we ever came to that, can you, can you comment on, on how that could even be broached? Well, simple, there are gains from trade, right? And U.S. consumers have gained a lot from cheap goods from China. And that's, that's a fact, and, and it disproportionately helps those with lower incomes. Yeah. I mean, that's an economic fact. I think that's a question that needs to be part of our debate as we think where to draw the line economically with China. If there's going to be a degree of coupling, a decoupling in areas that are dual use with security, implications or high tech with implications for competitors of the US economy and US firms, you know, those are difficult trade off decisions to make. But if you try to go all the way to cut all Chinese goods out of the US market, you know, first thing, as you say, that imposes a tremendous cost on American consumers. And second, at the end of the day, a lot of that production will migrate to other places. Mm -hmm. Um, and won't necessarily bring that much industry back to the United States. Um, so those are facts that we just have to yeah. deal with. No, I think that's fair. I'd just also say, though, that that, 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 uh, that trade situation is not static. Yeah, true. Really, that, so as the Chinese economy grows, uh, China becomes less competitive, actually, in some of these in low-end yeah. manufacturing. That's already migrating. That's right. Uh, and also, there's all sorts of motivations for uh, onshoring manufacturing mm -hmm. back back to the United States, and also on the Chinese side, right? As as China as the Chinese consumer economy grows, uh, there's you know, and and China increasingly embraces a, a consumption-led uh, economic growth strategy. There's a good argument actually that you know, interdependence is actually going to decrease over time. So just naturally, because of th developments on both on both sides and patterns of trade. And, and you missed TX Hamas's argument yesterday about deglobalization as a trend in the yeah. economy where he had some of these points that will also change. Yeah. Well, uh, we're out of time, unfortunately, but please uh, join me in thanking the two panelists. Yeah. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, that was good. That was good. I wish we should do this again.